Okay. Uh, yeah, let me just get started. Um, yeah. Uh, thanks, Ricardo. Thanks, um, Josh, for, for convening this and thanks for inviting me to talk about our scaling time work. Um, so this is actually my first NFA conference. Uh, it's been really great. I've been, I've been learning a lot. I've been regret, regretting not going to, uh, to more, but I'll, I'll be here uh, from now on, I'm sure. Um, yeah, so we've been using the QDM or the quantum diamond microscope to look at some spaleothems and uh, creating maps um, at high resolution that resolves these uh, laminae. Um, so first I'm gonna um, give an overview of what I think are some of the, the major questions uh, in terms of our challenges in terms of interpreting spaleothems as a paleo environment proxy. Um, and then I'll talk about some, some ways that maps like this might be able to help us uh, address some of these problems. Okay, so uh, first I just wanna back up here and, uh, and talk about um, the, the paleoclimate background. So as I'll talk about in the next few slides, most of the, the spaleothem magnetism work um, in terms of paleo environmental proxies have, have focused on Spaleothem magnetism as a paleo precipitation proxy specifically, right? So, i.e., the inferring the amount of rainfall, like the millimeters per year, for example, um, in a certain region in the in the past. Um, so, this is important, and there's a lot of attention in the paleoclimate community paid to paleo precipitation proxy in in particular, um, partly because precipitation patterns are are notoriously difficult to forecast. Um, so unlike temperature, where there's a global budget, and uh, we know that there's more greenhouse effect and that budget is going up, um, precipitation depends on how moisture is distributed and therefore wind pattern changes. And so uh, just as an example of this uh, difficulty, uh, this is a IPCC report on Africa uh, later this century. And so you can see there's, there are models that predict fairly large changes in precipitation, right, up to about 50%. But um, agreement between the models is hard to come by. Uh, you can see that the areas with white dots is, is pretty small. So um, the attraction of looking at paleo precipitation is that if we can see how precipitation changed in a certain environment uh, during colder and warmer periods in the past, uh, we can try to use that knowledge to um, assess whether some of these projections are reasonable. Um, and so there are other uh, ways and much more popular ways to try to infer paleo precipitation. Probably the most uh, well-known is delta 18 O. So this is the oxygen isotopic composition of the spaleothem itself. Um, so delta 18 O certainly tells us a lot about um, the paleo environment. But the challenge is it, it's, it, it's affected by a lot of different factors. Right, so the delta 18 o you finally um, uh, measure in your cave deposit is a function of the original delta 18 o in the cloud that forms over the ocean, how it's distilled over the land surface, and also finally mixing and evaporation effects after the rain, rainfall occurs. Um, so this is very useful in many ways. Um, it tells us about all these different processes uh, or some convolution of them. Um, but what we want and hope for out of a spaleothem magnetism proxy is that it's a targeted proxy of just local precipitation, that it, it responds as purely as possible just to local uh, precipitation. Um, and this kind of makes sense. Uh, so we know that water is responsible for depositing magnetic particles on, on spaleothems. So uh, changes in the local um, precipitation, the, the amount of moisture available should influence the particle concentration. So um, I just want to go over three case studies here. And I think uh, this is almost a almost a exact repetition of what you've all showed, but a little bit, a little bit different. So um, uh, let me just repeat some of the things we already covered. So um, so one case study is the Born et al. paper from um, I guess six, about six years ago. So this is again a mid-latitude cave in West Virginia, and they concluded that higher um, magnetic content of the spaleothem corresponds to wetter summer, uh, more summer rainfall, wetter summers. 
And that's because it correlates with these enriched um, oxygen 18 uh, episodes. And that is believed to correspond to more summer precipitation, but warmer precipitation. And that enhances pedogenesis um, and the formation of fine scale magnetite. And that magnetite gets washed into the cave. All right, so higher magnet magnetization is more summer rainfall. Um, more recent paper from the, from the same group. So this is um, a fairly thin that has been shown already this morning, but again, they use this good microscope to measure the uh, concentration of uh, magnetic particles. Uh, what they found is comparing to the historical record, um, time periods with a lot of um, high uh, extreme events or high rainfall events that are uh, well above the normal um, rate of rainfall correspond to regions of strong magnetization. Um, so the idea here is that there was flooding in this cave and the floodwaters carried the trinal particles that coated the stalagmite and led to these enhanced layers. So in this case, magnetization corresponds to extreme rainfall. Uh, and as you've all showed earlier, so this is uh, the, the last case study I'll show. This is Jaqueto et al, 2016. This is a tropical cave, no flooding. And um, as you all said earlier, the relationship here is the opposite. So you have higher magnetization corresponding to more enriched C13 values. So a shift towards more um, uh, drought or arid environment suitable plants. And um, they interpret this to mean that uh, during these drier episodes, there was more soil erosion and therefore higher dust flux into the cave. Okay, so just to summarize this, and this is the problem that uh, I think you all have already summarized earlier. So these three studies um, have show that in different environments, uh, magnetism uh, in spaleothems point to different, uh, uh, different features of the, of the paleo environment. And in some cases, it could be almost opposite features, right? So aridity versus higher precipitation. Um, so the point I want to make here, and this kind of guides the thinking for the rest of this talk, is that the, the relationship between magnetism and precipitation depends completely, even the sign of it, uh, dep depends on the mechanism of, the, of magnetic particle enrichment. And this mechanism must be known for a given speleothem before we can extract um, reliable paleoclimate information. Um, so the rest of this talk, I just want to talk about some possible ways we can use high resolution imaging of spaleothems to answer this, I think, key question. Um, and um, from that, proceed on to actual paleoclimate um, paleo information. Um, so just to review, the, the QDM is this um, high resolution magnetic imager. So it takes a, a image of of magnetic fields at a height of a few microns above a flat surface. Um, I'll show this data a bit more later, but this is this is aspeleothem. These are the, the laminae, um, and the QDM map uh, with a with a one tesla IRM looks something like this. So you can see regions where there's strong fields. And what we can do then is take uh, average across um, these single layers, and then come up with the time series. Um, as long as we have a geochron model um, of the magnetization through time, or sorry, actually the magnetic field through time, but a uh, proxy form of magnetization. Okay, so um, I just want to summarize the, the structure of the, the next um, part of this talk here, uh, and then I'll go into each of these uh, points in detail. So I just want to talk about a few strategies um, where we can use the QDM potentially to uh, answer the question of what is the enrichment mechanism uh, for magnetic particles in the, in the speleothem. Um, so one, one uh, natural outcome of the high resolution is that uh, we can get annual resolution um, time series from even fairly slowly growing speleothems. So this is uh, somewhat similar to the squid micro microscope study that um, Feinberg and others did uh, recently, um, but at even higher spatial resolution. And the idea here is once we have annually resolved time series, we can actually compare it to instrumental records of precipitation. So we can 
uh, do a, you, we can make a direct benchmark um, comparison between uh, known precipitation amounts uh, as well uh, against um, the response of the, mag of the magnetization signal. Um, so because historical records are relatively short, one to 200 years in most places, um, we need as much data as possible in that small interval of time. And that's where the high resolution comes in. Um, a second strategy as I'll talk about is using textual evidence. So this has come up a little bit already today um, in uh, Yuming's talk. Um, but once you, when you can isolate the magnetic signals at the, these some millimeter scales, you can compare it to um, textural changes in the Spalio FM. And that can tell you, um, that can give you some complementary information. And then finally, since this is a rock magnetic conference, uh, you can use rock magnetism changes in the Spalio FM um, through time to infer its, its origin. All right, so let me just go over these examples. Um, so one, let's look at a, a, an example of a high resolution recent record and the comparison against um, uh, instrumental data. So this is uh, from Lapa do Onsa in Brazil, uh, which Ricardo um, and I have been to a couple of times. Um, and uh, we, we uh, dated this Spalio FM um, and found that it has a pretty linear growth rate uh, for the last about 100 years, 150 years. And in this place, there is actually um, good um, instrumental data up to or back to 1913. All right, so if we can come up with an annually resolved or maybe even better um, time series uh, in this interval, we can compare it to the rain gauge record. OK, so this is the. Um, the stitched together, this is the, the stitched together version of a bunch of uh, maps similar to what I showed earlier. So you look at the, the fluctuations in the magnetic field over the different parts of the scale of them and, and um, anchor that to a, to a, um, to a chronology. Um, you can roughly see some areas with kind of more um, pigment tend to have higher magnetizations, but not all of them, as you can see. OK, so what we can do, uh, first of all, is we can just um, simply plot this against a, um, the, the rain gauge record. So the, the rainfall is here in blue. And uh, the magnetization or the magnetic field is plotted. So it, we're plotting um, with higher magnetization down, right? So this, this axis is reversed here. Um, and if you just do a simple simple correlation, you can see there is a significant relationship. It's fairly noisy. Um, so there's, pro there's probably a lot of other effects going on. But there is some um, correlation there. And this, this suggests, just like in the Jaqueto paper earlier, that um, higher rainfall years uh, or intervals seem to correspond to uh, less magnetic particles or fewer magnetic particles in the Spalio FM. Um, so maybe this isn't too surprising. This is, although it's not geographically super close to the Spalio FM where that Jaqueta analyzed, it is in the same kind of environment. Uh, so maybe it is the, the dry years and the in increased mobilization of dust that, um, and that really increases the, the magnetization of the Spalio FMs. All right, so one can say that, you know, there is a lot of other effects here. This isn't the, the tightest correlation ever. Um, so let's come up with some hopefully complementary evidence here. Um, and so let, that brings me to the second line of uh, investigation. So looking at textual evidence. Uh, so actually these exact plots have been shown already in Yuming's talk, or, or at least this, this study has been. Um, so I won't, won't talk about this too much, but basically uh, wetter and drier conditions can actually lead to uh, distinct um, morphologies in the, in the layering, the spalio FM. So these are type E erosion surfaces. So basically you have undersaturated uh, drip water. So wet periods that actually erode into previously deposited spalio FM uh, lamellae. So you get these mesa-like features. And then this is the opposite. When you have dry conditions, you have a thinning of the depositional um, area. And so you have this kind of thinning of the spalio FM and then it kind of recovers back to its normal width. 
once you have higher precipitation again. Um, so we look for these E and L type um, lamel, uh, laminae in our spaleothem, and we can see that, so there's three intervals where we identify there is uh, L type surfaces. So these are again, our, our regions where you have a thinning of the depositional surface corresponding to, um, to lessened precipitation during those times. So you can see they correspond to these recent peaks in the, um, in the magnetic field data. Um, we didn't see an L-type surface in the 1930s, even though it was relatively uh, magnetic in that part of the spaleothem. But at least in these recent periods, there seemed to be a direct correspondence between these dry conditions as indicated by the, by the, the layer morphology and enrichment of magnetism. Um, and just as another example of using textual evidence, uh, this is also an uh, aspect that's been brought up earlier. Uh, this is the, actually the same spaleothem um, uh, or analyzed by Jack Hato et al. Uh, in 2016. So, uh, and I showed this data earlier, but I'm showing here again with a little bit more, more um, detail. So you have these very strong magnetically um, concentrated layers growing towards the right here. Um, and if we look at the the, the calcite crystals, and this is just reflected light with cross polar, so nothing fancy there. Uh, what we can see is you have these long lasts, right? These larger um, calcite crystals that um, seem to start from these, these layers, right? And this is a well-known effect, and this has already also been brought up earlier in this session, that uh, once when you have hiatuses, uh, and Basically, you stop growing the pre-existing calcite crystals and you sometimes interrupt them with some contamination of the surface. You restart the, the, the growth of new crystals of calcite. And so you have these kind of aligned um, crystals after a hiatus. And that, this also agrees with the idea that these stronger, mag stronger magnetization uh, regions correspond to times of lower, uh, lower moisture in the, in the environment. Um, so this is, again, um, consistent with the, the conclusion from Chirketo et al. All right, so going to the last part, so the actual uh, rock magnetism. Um, yeah, so we, because we can image this thing over and over again, we can do treatments, um, like for example, uh, iron backfield experiment and actually extract uh, iron backfield curve in different parts of this, um, this this image, right? So we have, we first imparted a strong IRM into the plane. So you get this blue signal, saturated signal everywhere, and then just start pulsing it with magnetic fields out of the plane until it gets saturated in the positive direction. Um, so we can isolate these regions um, and we can actually plot the backfield curve for each, each region. Uh, so what's clear here is that there are actually there are real um, differences in the in the magnetic um, particle assemblage in these small regions. So what we can do is look for changes in the magnetic um, assemblage through time, right? And it's it's a little time intensive to do this uh, this full you know 20 30 uh, data point backfield curve for every um, part of this paleothem. So what we can do then is parameterize this backfield curve by giving it, by measuring it at, at negative saturation, positive saturation, and this one measurement in the middle where this curve is most steep. And so what we can do with this is parameterize these curves using the, the remnants fraction with a coercivity above this, this particular value. And using this, it's just a faster way of uh, extending this, um, this information across a larger section of the spaleothem without having to do each one of these measurements. So that's the curve that was here and it's actually shown in the small insight in, in Yuval's talk, I think. Uh, so what we can see here is that, um, while there are some small changes in the uh, magnetic, the, the high coercivity fraction um, through, um, through these different magnetized layers, uh, they're actually uh, not significant changes relative to just variations within these layers. So that's what these error bars are. Uh, so basically changes from one time to another in the magnetic assemblage 
is contained within the variation of the assemblage within in, 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 at any given time. Um, so basically, what, what I think is the appropriate conclusion here is that the, these depositional intervals uh, where you have high enhanced magnetization are all sampling the same magnetic grain population. Right. In this, uh, in this case, I think actually provides some clue to the, uh, to the, to the nature of this enrichment mechanism. Um, so it has been, uh, been um, discussed in other papers that if you have a flood mechanism, because a, great, a larger flood can loft larger particles, uh, you would expect a, a coarser grain size um, population in a larger flood event. So you would, so if this were, if these were floods, you would expect uh, a coarser population of magnetic grains in a very strong layer like this compared to these weaker ones. Uh, and we don't see that. So that supports a non-flood origin, I think, for this scale event, which again is consistent with the, um, the textual evidence as well as um, the Nijakita study from earlier. So this kind of um, uh, tracking of rock, rock magnetic properties through time might be useful for other speleothems that are not as well studied and we don't know, we can't rule out um, flooding as a mechanism. All right, so just to summarize these three uh, different strategies I discussed. Um, so again, benchmarking uh, the speleothem magnetization against indisputable uh, records of um, precipitation from instruments. Um, so the challenge there is one, you have to find suitable samples that actually grew within the historical time period, of course. And second, and this is a problem for any uh, kind of these benchmark studies, including O18, and it's that um, the mechanism of, of magnetic particle enrichment in the last hundred years isn't necessarily what happened a thousand years ago. So there's some caveats to this, um, but at least it, it gives you some um, some indication of what the, what the more recent processes have been in this environment. Uh, second, looking for texture changes. Um, and I think this can be very powerful um, because uh, it turns out I think some of these crystallographic changes as well as these, um, uh, these, these um, growth um, features like the, the layer, um, like the L type uh, and E type uh, layers are actually pretty common in different scale events, but it's still limited to certain conditions, right? You can have a drier period that does not um, induce an, uh, a change in the depositional surface, for example. Um, and finally, uh, inferring the deposition me mechanism through rock magnetic changes. So the challenges here is that uh, we've demonstrated, I think, uh, a way forward for um, looking at a flood mechanism, but there's other mechanisms that we would hope to develop some kind of rock magnetic proxy for. Uh, and also, you, it's, this is relatively labor intensive. So let me just talk about these challenges um, for another couple of slides and I'll be done. Um, so yeah, we talked about uh, floods versus non-floods, but I think there's other information we can tease out in using um, uh, these, these high resolution magnetic images. Um, so for example, this is another spalea film we've been working on, um, also from Brazil. And what we see in this case, um, it's kind of cool, is that you actually have um, certain layers that are very continuous and some others that are, are relatively discrete. And this, act, this pattern actually occurs throughout a, a fairly large interval. We haven't really dug into this too much, we, but um, one can imagine that these represent different depositional mechanisms. Um, so looking at, um, uh, for example, the grain uh, assemblage between these, these regions um, might tell us something about whether the source of these two different layers are in fact different. We have some indication these discrete ones have higher coercivity, but uh, we haven't quantified it very well. So anyway, there's other uh, features in these high-resolution maps that might make you um, suspect that uh, a certain or more than one um, deposition mechanisms or enrichment mechanisms are going on. Um, this is uh, just a quick slide on a, a way to save time, basically, and, and get some rock magnetic information. 
Um, so because the, the QDM measures with a bias field, um, and, and we normally flip the bias field a number of times during the measurement to cancel it out. So we have a pure remnant signal. So we can actually use that fact to uh, actually, we can look at the data before we cancel out the bias field during the measurement. Uh, and so what this actually does, and I can talk about this in, in more detail how it works, but basically what this does is it actually uh, tells us the viscosity of the, of the particles. So these maps might look pretty similar, but if you actually subtract them, what you see is this stuff, this population of grains is preserved, but this grain here disappears. Uh, what this shows is that this population of grains here uh, acquired a, a VRM over the, the time span of the QDM experiment, and this one didn't. Um, so there are tricks like this uh, where we don't have to take extra data, but we can make some in, um, infer some information about the, uh, the, the rock magnetic properties. And finally, you can just do more measurements. Uh, I, I, this is not prohibitive, I think. Uh, so for example, if you were to do the kind of coercivity param parameter tracking over a sample about this big, um, it would take about 90 hours of instrument time. So that's, that's a lot, but you know, it's a couple of weeks, it's, it can be done. Um, and then there's some ideas we can uh, make basically sample throughput in the QDM higher better in the works. All right, so this is just to summarize. There's multiple uh, mechanisms for incorporating magnetic particles into, sp into speleothems. And I think um, using high resolution uh, time series, we can compare time series to instrumental records. And using the maps themselves, we can look for rock magnetic changes as well as re relationship to some millimeter scale textural changes. And I think these are uh, potentially powerful in, um, in isolating or identifying the mechanism of magnetic particle enrichment and, and from that make a more reliable interpretation of what it means for the environment. Thanks, that's all I had. Thanks a lot, Roger, for the very nice uh, talk and it, uh, very nice results. Uh, uh, does anyone have any question uh, to start? Uh, Roger, I, uh, I'd like just just to start by uh, uh, asking about the. Uh, so uh, you're trying to, to couple the um, micro uh, stratigraphy with the uh, magnetic measurements. Uh, do you think it's possible to to do that uh, at the scale of the whole spectrum? Because it's uh, the, the the big problem about the QDM is to to get the results from a what we call, would call large scale, like centimeter scale uh, spectrum. Uh, yeah, you mean instead of measuring in one kind of profile here, you can measure kind yeah, of- Yeah, to have an, uh, an area, instead of uh, just a uh, line, to have a uh, area uh, along uh, uh, the spectrum. Yeah, I think, um, so ultimately, I think the, the field of view size of the QDM is limited by the largest diamond that can be made, uh, you know, that has the, the nitrogen vacancy centers in it. And that's about four millimeters wide right now. Um, so yeah, you can imagine, yeah, tiling a whole bunch of four millimeter sized uh, uh, fields, of, fields of use on here, that will be, the way to do it. So it's certainly doable. Uh, it's just a matter of time. I think, yeah, I mean, like I said in the last slide, one of these kind of quality of life upgrades we're looking at is, you know, trying to motorize and automate this, right? So you can kind of leave this whole thing on there and come back in a week and I'll be done. Uh, that'd be great. Um, but yeah, like there's no technical, uh, you know, difficulty with that. It's just a matter of, of how much time uh, one has to devote to this. Thank you. I think that Williams has a question. Yes. Uh, great talk, Roger. I definitely want a Q QDM myself. Uh, I think that's the, <laughs> I think I take away from that. Uh, one, one question really, so I don't really know too much about the QDM. Uh, the, um, so it was a really nice talk and, you know, going through it, I was thinking, um, 
you know, how do you how do you get some information about the mineralogy or the grain size? And so the, I, I thought your backfield uh, observations were quite nice, actually. But but then I was thinking um, this is a purely a surface measurement, right? And I just wondered to what extent the uh, the sample preparation actually uh, interfered with the particles that you're actually observing, because you must be dominated by the very near surface particles, right? Yeah, so uh, you know, so we're measuring the the field. You know, in this case, uh, I think about five microns above the surface. Um, so you're right; it is kind of weighted towards the the shallower sources. Um, you know, we can. I guess there are a couple answers to that. One is you can kind of quantify how deep you're sensing by actually just you know taking some isolated sources and and kind of fitting them to see how deep the the, the source must be. Um, and you know, doing that, like I think you know, we're seeing a few tens of microns into the sample um, in, in in these cases. Uh, it depends on how strong the particles are, of course. Right? If they're too weak, then then you just won't see them um, deeper down. And one other way to do this is actually introduce purposely introduce a spacing, right? So if you if you space the the sensing surface from the sample surface by say 50 microns. Then you know the difference between the surface of the sample and, and 50 microns deeper isn't as large anymore. Uh, so doing that, you know, we've uh, done inversions on sources that are a couple hundred microns deep. Um, okay. So it does, uh, yeah, it does. It does cover, I guess, still a very small volume by you know 2G standards, but uh, um, you know. But you're, you're pretty confident it, it, it's not a surface effect entirely in terms of the... Yeah, no, in this case, I think, um, you know, especially because the, the magnetic particles are spread out through the volume, right? I think the surface preparation is not a problem. Uh, you know, if this were a, a metal meteorite or something, uh, I would be a little more worried about it. Okay, great. Uh, great talk, really enjoyed it. Thanks. Uh, do we have another question? Uh, yeah, can I ask a question? Um, yes. uh, so yeah, Roger, do you, have you, from your backfill curves and things like that, and, and looking at your induced signals versus your remnant signals, do you, do you have a sense for what proportion of the signal you're seeing is carried by, you know, large MD grains versus pseudo single domain versus a single domain population? Are you dominated by the, the larger grains or the, or the smaller grains or somewhere in between? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. So um, yeah, the answer is yes. I think we, we, we can at least, sorry, I, I just stopped sharing. So maybe I can uh, share a different plot and I'll pull that up while I talk. Um, so yeah, because the, because the QDM, again, because it uses bias fields that are, that are canceled out during the measurement, we can kind of purposely look at the induced component um, instead of the, the remnant component. Um, so we have this figure in, the, in our paper earlier this year. So yeah, so in this case, um, yeah, in this case, yeah, this is the, the, the remnant map and this is induced map. In this case, the remnant map seems uh, a good deal stronger than the other one. Um, so this is uh, specific to the biosphere we're using. So this is basically induced in a, in a nine gauss uh, magnetic field. So I guess what is it, 900 microteslas. Um, we can, in principle, do this map more than once, right? And at different different bias fields, and, and trying to see what the how how this signal breaks down in terms of the um, the coercivity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we do get that indication of kind of ferro to para ratio in in these maps, and just from experience, you know, running all sorts of samples, um, there's a wide range of that. There's some samples that are are clearly para-dominated and some that have almost no para-signal. But do you know, you know, the sort of remnant signal you're seeing is, is have you been able to break it down into, oh, this is predominantly carried by multi-domain grains in no. that size range? Yeah, or, or no, small? small grain size. Um, 
Yeah, I guess. Um, yeah, so how do you get grain size out of these? So yeah, I guess the one problem or limitation, I guess, right now is, uh, yeah, so we, we can't do high field in in field measurements, right? So we can't get MS, right? Um, and you can't do hysteresis curves on a QDM map. Although in theory, we can, it's, it's doable. So what we're stuck with, I think, is kind of these remnant-based proxies. Uh, and I guess also this, this idea of the, the viscous remnants um, as a proxy for the really fine grain. So yeah, I, I don't think we can make a day plot, you know, something at that level of specificity, but I think um, more qualitatively, you can definitely see some samples or some layers are clearly softer um, or harder than others. Okay, thanks. Uh, Roger, um, do you think we can, we can get some paleomag results from, from the QDM from the speleothems? Uh, yeah, I hope so. <laughs> yeah, I think I think uh, I think the problem we're running into there is uh, is really the magnetic recording limit than than you know sample size or growth rate or anything like that. Um, but yeah, I mean we you know we we're trying to measure interms on on the QDM in the SPLFM or in the SPLFM on the QDM. Um, it's detectable uh, at least in the stronger intervals. Um, but yeah, I think it. I think it. It comes down to picking the right samples at that point because I think some of these areas just just don't have enough magnetic grains to to be capturing the, the field. But yeah, with very strongly magnetized layers, maybe maybe it can. Yeah, that that be amazing. Yeah, if you have any very strongly magnetized paleothems, intent. No, no, I had a question. Yuan? Um, sort of piggybacking on the grain size question, how hard would it be to do an ARM and uh, get the ratio of ARM to IRM uh, in terms of, one, in, inverting, if necessary, the, uh, mag the magnetization or the, yeah, the field to, to get magnetizations, and then to align the two in order to get a ratio Align the two uh, images. Yeah, no, that's 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 easily doable, right? So instead of an IRM, we give it an ARM, and uh, yeah, I mean, for for these samples, they have enough grains that the ARMs look very reasonable. Uh, they're weaker in, in the same direction as the bias field. The problem with like, and this kind of goes to Ricardo's question a little bit, like for areas with very few magnetic particles at this scale, uh, sometimes ARMs just look completely random, right? Because as you expect, right? If only one percent or a couple percent of the of the particles are aligned, uh, so then it's uh, then it's very hard. But yeah, but with these failures with a lot of fine particles, IRM ARM ARM IRM ratio is is easy to do. Um, just by using the ARM field and IRM fields, or do you need to do the inversion? Uh, yeah, I mean, if it's unidirectional, just using the fields is fine. Yeah, so that, that's the advantage of the, the ARM, IRM. Yeah, if we're gonna do something like, um, uh, you know, so if, if the if the direction is not so obvious, right? You have a mix of positive and negative in the in the same field. Um, yeah, then we might think about you know isolating a small block and doing a net movement analysis. But for, yeah, for again, for all the samples I've shown, I think the, the magnetic field has actually been pretty, a pretty good proxy. Um, right? The fact we get reasonable backfield curves at all, right? Um, that is not so sensitive to the exact sample placement, for example. Um, yeah. Roger, can I piggyback on a question? Uh, you mentioned that um, maybe in in, in theory, it's possible to measure hysteresis loops within a QDM. What about low field susceptibility, you know, DC susceptibility, and then normalize by that to eliminate the concentration effect? Yeah, so I guess we would uh, ramp the, the bias field across some numbers, right? And then just kind of take the same map. Yeah, no, that's, that's, um, 
That's doable. So what, what, what low fields are you thinking? So just as low as possible, yeah. <laughs> I would say. Right. Um, yeah, you it's, use a, it's a 80 micro Tesla right now. The bias field bias, that you oh, yeah. uh, 900 micro Tesla. 900 micro Tesla. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, you know, you can get lower, um, mm -hmm. potentially a lot lower uh, yeah, into a few micro Tesla range, but yeah. So it's, yeah, it's possible to, to ramp that. Um, and yeah, get the, yeah, fit the, fit the slope. Okay. Cool. Yeah, we should talk about that. I haven't really thought about how to use that properly. Thanks. Yeah, I think, uh, do, do we have a, another uh, final question? If not, I think that uh, that's the end of the, in the session. And uh, I'd like to, to thank everyone to be there and then for the uh, speakers as well. Uh, and it was a very nice session and I'm very glad that uh, it happened. Uh, uh, Josh, would you like to, to say some words? Yeah, really quick. Thank you for everybody who's stuck it out all the way to the end here. We're a little bit past schedule, so I really appreciate everybody's patience. Um, hopefully it was a sign of, of good, hearty discussions. And, one of, the thing, one of the things I really liked about all the presentations were the ways that the speakers identified all the opportunities for further research. There's so much more to do uh, and there's so many problems to figure out. So thank you everybody. Uh, thanks to all the invited speakers. Thanks once again to Larry Edwards for his talk as well in the dating of Spiliothems and looking forward to seeing all of you tomorrow. <laughs>